Apple was uh, and still is a visionary company under a visionary leadership. Remember that Microsoft is a software company and our interest was in software and we were eager to work on the best hardware available. And even more than that, I think we were really committed to, to GUI. And it's, it's really a historical accident that uh, through a series of, of uh, very fortuitous and clever choices, Apple was the first that reached the kind of the configuration and performance uh, with the Macintosh that was able to implement GUI to its fullest. And of course, we were there to exploit it, and we did. We learned a lot from it, the marketplace learned from it. And at the time when the more dominant platform, the Intel uh, IBM compatible platform, inevitably reached the level of sophistication and performance, then we were ready to do the software for that platform, which was, of course, Windows and the porting of the applications Word and Excel and the other programs in the suite to, to Windows. The issue had to do with our relationship with IBM. Whatever individual merits of these two systems were, one of them was, let's see, burdened by the IBM participation, the other one was not. And uh, the choice was, um, do you want to to put your best efforts and best talent on, on, this, on the system that, that, that you control or uh, another system that, that, that you do not control and in fact another organization that is somewhat unwieldy, well, quite unwieldy, let's say, has a, a big participation in it and I think that the answer is clear. The real question is why did we stay with IBM for that long? And that has, of course, logical explanation because IBM was a key factor in the early development of, of personal computers. In fact, they made the personal computer legitimate for business, just like Excel perhaps made the Macintosh legitimate for business. So business legitimacy is, is very, very important uh, in the, certainly the consumer market is a giant market, but it, you cannot start there. You have to start at the market segment that where the value is the highest, where you can, can support the highest prices and the early adapters. And, and it's really business. Business is the key starter to any market segment. And IBM's participation was key. And our cooperation with IBM was key to Microsoft. And uh, Microsoft bore a lot of burden to maintain that participation in the early days, uh, but we did it because the, the relationship was so important. Now, as the market grew, and in fact, the uh, IBM compatible market got established and grew thereby, the relative participation of IBM was less important. And there was obviously some time when these two curves, uh, namely the importance of IBM to Microsoft and the participation of IBM in the total market, these two curves would cross, at which points changes would have to be made. And I think that's such a, the, the OS2 decision was just such an inflection point. I knew that the platform would be much better. It would be something that we would control. And second, it simplifies the, uh, the development of software if you can optimize to one platform rather than try to split it between multiple platforms. And it will be clearly better for the consumer too. When I travel, I have to take a travel clock with me because I have great difficulty in adjusting the alarm clocks in hotel rooms. Yet, if I want to use a computer, I can just go downstairs in a hotel and in the uh, public office I can use Windows because it's standard. Imagine if a computer were as hard to use as an alarm clock. I mean, the market would never get as, as big as it gets now. I mean, when you are interchanging files, sending pictures and mails to everybody, you sit down to any computer anywhere in the world in an internet cafe. That won't be possible without creating a, a, a standard that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is understood by everyone. And I think uh, Windows is, is, is such a standard. I mean, it's just uh, very lucky for the world that it happened that way. Let's talk about just the clunkiness of Windows. That's, of course, is an undeniable fact, but, but what's behind it is that the hardware was growing up 
uh, relatively slowly. And I think that as the, as the hardware features, and some of them have to do with even the chip design, that was argued much about uh, the early days and the requirements of an operating system to the chip, even to the screens. I remember in the um, early days of Windows, Steve Jobs was taunting us how the Mac looked better in every way. Even the pixels looked better on the, on the Mac. And what's annoying about this, that he was right. How can a pixel look bad? A pixel is just a, a, the smallest unit on the screen. There, there should be no difference between, at least at that level, there should be no difference between the two. But it turns out that IBM has chosen pixels in the early IBM PCs that weren't square. They were really rectangles. And in fact, those pixels didn't look as good as, as the square pixels that uh, Macintosh chose for pretty obvious reasons. Now, it's, you could talk, why, why did IBM ch uh, choose that strange shape? Uh, there are reasons for it, and some of those reasons were even valid in the, the 1981 or 1980 time frame when the IBM PC was designed. We had to wait until all of those features of the hardware were gotten rid of or kind of washed out of the system and you could rely on square pixels. But finally, when the hardware looked as well as the Macintosh and the hardware worked as well as the Macintosh, uh, Windows was there, and you know, it, which happened basically at Windows 3 and, and then Windows 95, uh, they were just tremendous, tremendous success. It was just inevitable that, that when graphical user interface, the best user interface meets the best, most widely available platform, then the results would be a blowout. I think that the uh, development of Office in the 90s turned from the technological point more into the marketing realm. The emphasis wasn't necessary anymore to worry about the kind of internal representations, the kind of computer platforms, of portability considerations and all that that was occupying us in the early days. And the, the, the question really came down to what are the features? What do people really need? What do you do to satisfy those needs? And many of these cases, uh, you know, we had to acquire products like, like PowerPoint, which was really a, a wonderful product and a new application area for Office that, that was a tremendous success. And uh, the inclusion of spelling checkers and grammar checkers and so on that again requiring uh, expertise in, in those areas. But it's really, and I think that the marketing people did a tremendous job in choosing the features. We had an expert team evaluating the user interface features in a usability lab, observing people, how they use the system and improving it so that they can interact it in more natural ways all the time. So I think that that was the movement of the emphasis away from the, from the pure technological approach that we had um, early on. My project at Xerox was Bravo, which was the first word processor in the GUI environment, which is typically called the WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get model of editing. So I had very good ideas about what works in that area and how to create the system. Again, all we had to do is wait for the time when the hardware was, was able to, to support uh, the, uh, kind of the kind of computation that is required by that. Uh, we did an early uh, prototype on MS-DOS, which was called MS-Word, with an interface that uh, resembled the uh, interface of Multiplan. Again, this product wasn't very successful in part because many of these features, which, which included, for example, the use of italics and the use of formatting in text in a particularly clever way, and that wasn't implemented by other word processes. But printers didn't support italics very well yet. Screens didn't support italics very well yet. So this was really just a, kind of a try of, of getting experience, uh, uh, getting the code uh, uh, ready. So when the opportunity came, then, then we would be ready. And of course the opportunity did come, first with Macintosh and then later with Windows. It did very well on the Macintosh. It was competing with a free product that was a bundled simple word processor that Apple created. Yet people were willing to spend uh, the extra uh, money to, to get a better word processor.
WordPerfect was a product of the time. It was something that was optimized for the environment that it was running in at the early days of personal computing. And it was very successful for that reason. And, and from that success, of course, came a long tail. It acquired many users, and those users believed in, uh, in compatibility and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Word was shooting way ahead into the future. Word really didn't have a chance of competing with something that is optimized for the present. But if you, if you have a long-term view, then there was no comparison. It didn't seem bothersome that WordPerfect was beating Word at, at the early days. In a, in a way, it was to be expected, and I think it was really um, a credit to Bill and the executive team that they kept with the project and believed in the future of both GUI and of the industry. They believed in the hardware partners that they would be able to deliver on the kind of computing performance that we would need for GUI. That they would include, uh, for example, mice or pointing devices in their computers and the necessary interfaces and so on and so forth. So we were aiming way ahead of, of WordPerfect, and, and there was just no, uh, uh, if, uh, if I had to bet, which I did have to bet actually, <laughs> I would, and I did bet on us rather than on them, and, and, and of course we were right. And that's what, what attracted me to, to Microsoft on, on, on day one, and, and I think that was uh, one of the important factors that made Microsoft as successful as it is. I went to, um, to Microsoft Research. I, I think that the next uh, stage of, of progress really wasn't my strength. This is really up for, for marketing people and also for, for people who can organize uh, larger teams of programmers to implement the ideas of marketing. So that really wasn't my strength, but I did notice that the way we create software is, um, uh, could be perhaps improved. And uh, I, I joined Microsoft Research and I, I um, started uh, researching this idea of generative programming or intentional programming. And I'm still pursuing those ideas through my own company now called Intentional Software Corporation. I uh, do try to simulate what could be in my head and, and I try to refine it to try just to focus and refine the details and imagine how it would be. And I think that more than anything, you have to be honest with yourself. You cannot just imagine the result of the success. You have to imagine the details and at each point criticize what could go wrong there or why, that, why was something not done before? What was the reason of not doing it? Uh, so uh, I think that it, it's really helpful. I mean, sometimes you find out that in fact the reasons were very strong and you overlook them. Sometimes by listing the reasons, you can find a weakness on them that, that, you, that you can exploit that, that, or, or, or an assumption that is maybe no longer true. So, so all of these things, uh, you cannot just focus on the, uh, on the end success. That, you know, that's science fiction, that anybody can imagine levitation, but then ask yourself, what are the consequences? Why is it that we don't levitate? What would be the problems to be overcome and so on? I wasn't planning to go to space. In fact, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the last century, it was, it was understood that only uh, uh, professionals, people who uh, essentially commit their lives uh, to, to space research, would be able to go to space. The idea of a space tourist uh, uh, sounded uh, uh, absurd in some ways. When space tourism first appeared, and it didn't make that many waves, I was an actual tourist who liked to visit, for example, launch sites and, and just look at rockets going in the sky. A tremendous experience, uh, very exciting, by the way, from the scary, in a way, from the outside. And, and at one of these trips, uh, I was approached by Space Adventures, and they asked, for, asked me first if I liked the experience, and I said, wow, you know, that's amazing, and being able to be that close to the cosmonauts and see them go up the rocket up close, and what a tremendous experience. And they said, well, you could be doing that. And uh, I was shocked, you know, I, I just, just of the thought that uh, somebody else thought that I might do that. I don't have the right stuff. Uh, we know that people with the right stuff can go, but what about the rest of us? And uh, I was very skeptical. Of course, I was intrigued, because who wouldn't be? Uh, 
And, uh, uh, but I, I, uh, I, I went step by step. I invited uh, some of the trainers. I realized that they have a training, uh, training program. It's extensive. You deal with a lot of doctors. Um, of course, in my age, it's, uh, it's really time to, to hook up with some doctors and get checked out. And I was a little bit late with that. And I thought, no, maybe this is, if nothing else, I get a great checkup out of this <laughs> one time. So I did uh, a lot of preliminary work. I worked with the trainer outside of the contract and uh, tried some of the things that you can try without uh, dealing with space adventures. For example, weightless flights. I didn't know that you can do that, but in fact, you can go to Fort Lauderdale, pay a ticket, and uh, go on a, you get about 15, 15 parabolas. Each parabola gives you about 20 seconds of weightlessness. And so I've done that, and, and I realized that weightlessness is a lot of fun. Um, I didn't seem to be getting sick, and, and so, so on. We went uh, step by step, and the uh, last step was uh, up the elevator. <laughs> And, uh, and there I was in space, amazing. And then uh, it was um, the last day I spent in, in space, I woke up and I was wondering, wow, what a nice place to be and, and what a nice sleep it is. This is the last time I'm in space. Uh, what should I do? Should I sleep? Should I, uh, should I enjoy the sight? You have to decide. And then I had this, this, just this, this feeling that maybe this is not the last time. So don't worry about it. I, so I got out, just enjoyed it. And in fact, the opportunity came up exactly two years later and, and I was able to go to space again because now as a relatively experienced person, I just realized why space organizations send their astronauts or cosmonauts um, uh, into space more than once as a matter of course, because they do a much better job the second time. And it's really, you are, you are now acclimatized to space and you are just much more efficient and you can accomplish much more, which I did the second time. So, but it was a tremendous experience. You can take all kinds of mementos, uh, you know, that took my wedding ring, and, but, uh, um, and uh, you know, other things. Um, but paper tape, the early computer programs were on, on eight level paper tape. And I took one of those paper tapes with me, yes. <laughs> It kind of to close the circle. It, it was obviously, it was the work with computers that put me on the path that led eventually, among other things, to the uh, International Space Station. So it seemed like a very appropriate and important mentor for my life. Mm -hmm.